my dear viewers, beginning today is the official Alliteration Gaming Patreon and channel members. Throughout my Patreon, we've got quite a few tiers you can check out in order to gain special perks and even commission videos that you'd like to see me upload onto the channel. Every tier includes a shout out on my supporter card at the beginning of all of my videos, along with the benefits of the tier itself. Following that, you can now also join the Alliteration Nation by becoming a channel member on the YouTube side of things. Pledging your subscription here as a member of the channel is going to grant you the same shout out on my supporter card as all the Patreon tiers do, as well as access to the members only channel on my Discord. You'll gain a member badge that will level up as you stay subscribed and access to my exclusive emotes when I stream on YouTube. If you're interested in checking out the Patreon, I'm going to have the link in the description and in the pinned comment down below, as well as the link to my Discord should you want to join that as well. And if you want to become a channel member, the big beautiful join button is front and center on my homepage right here. And if you do decide to support the channel in any way whatsoever, know that I am unimaginably grateful and I can't wait to provide you with even more top-notch content at my trademark top speed. Now, let's get on to the video. Good evening, my dear viewers. Welcome to another Alliteration Gaming video. My name is Levi and today I'm going to be a little bit of a teacher. So if you clicked on this video, you're probably either interested in getting into the EMHA card game or you're fairly new to it and you, like many others including myself when I first started, are absolutely stumped on how to build a proper deck in this game. Block zone coverage this, deck stability that, all these terms being thrown around probably sound totally alien and you want a good place to find out quickly and easily what it takes to deck build in this game. Well I've got some good news and I've got some bad news for you. The bad news is it never really gets easy. The good news is though, once you get the hang of a few basic principles, that's actually the most fun part about it. So, my dear viewers, join me on this journey as I, to the best of my ability, will give you all the knowledge you need to start churning out decks in the MHA card game. So I spoke about basic principles, and that's how we're going to break down this process. First, let's talk about card types. There are five different card types throughout the MHA CCG. For this portion of the video though, we're just going to focus on the two primary types, the orange attacks and the gray foundations. Being that they're how you close out games, your attack cards are usually the more impactful of the two and are usually going to be what you settle on first that end up defining the rest of your deck. Your attack lineup should be a package of moves that fulfills several different purposes. They should allow you to poke your rival in the early game threaten them in the mid game and eventually finish them off in the final stages of the game. You should have a vision of the scenarios that every attack is inside of your deck for. You should know when you want to see them and why. Your attacks that draw cards and recur your resources are generally best during the early game setup. Your attacks that eat up your rival's resources and make future attacks even stronger are great for setting up those big turns. And of course, your finishing moves should be the most powerful in the late game after you've worn your rival down. Down a lot. Simply put, your attacks should tell a story, a story that results in your victory. When you're looking at your whole lineup all together, they should create a winning image in your head, a string you can visualize that spells victory for you. Now let's run it back to foundations, because we can't put together these wicked attack chains without any resources to commit, and that's where these guys come in. Your foundations should be a blend of everything you want to do. They should support your character perfectly, pick them up when they're down, and patch up any holes that they might have. For example, if you're a very aggressive character, you might want lots of defensive foundations so you can prop up your survival tactics that your character doesn't necessarily assist with. Alternatively, you might just want to put tons of aggressive foundations in your deck and instead try to close games incredibly early before you even have to worry about defense. It's all about figuring out what you want your deck to do and what it needs the most. You're going to have many more foundations in your deck than attacks, so there's a lot more room for creative freedom in how you want to interact with your deck as a whole and your winning image. Next, let's talk briefly about the more minor card types in the game, the blue actions and the green assets. Actions are basically the spell cards of this game, and assets are kind of just super foundations with more powerful abilities, but you can't commit them for resources. I'm lumping these two together because neither of these card types are hyper integral to the gameplay of most decks in the game, and they're usually played sparringly in smaller copies because of it. Actions and assets both hinder deck building in a way since by default they do not serve the two primary functions of the game, attacking our rival and establishing the cards to pay for said attacks. 
That being said, they do have very strong applications when they're used right and they're extremely powerful, so you have to be very aware of them. Now I've talked a little bit about the fifth and final card type, the character, but let's delve into them some more. Your character is what defines everything. Every single card that goes into your deck is there because it interacts positively with the hero or villain you've chosen to be the helm of everything it is that you do. Going even further, your character is also going to help define what ratios and rules you want your deck building to adhere to. One of the things that makes deck building so difficult in this game is that nothing is set in stone nearly as much as in any other card game. Sure, there are like rough guidelines to follow, but for the most part, everything is a much more case by case basis, as different characters and playstyles are going to constantly throw countless exceptions at anything that even tries to be a rule when it comes to deck building here. This is one of the greatest strengths of the game. This game allows for a massive amount of player expression. Even amongst the top players and their decks, you're still going to see minor differences here and there that are usually just based on personal preference rather than someone thinking they found the perfect deck list. Alright, so that was a ton of words, but not actually a terribly large amount of info. Everything we just talked about covers much more the spirit of deck building in this game, but now it's time to talk about the science. I said that there were not a ton of rules when it comes to making decks here, and while that is true, there is still some baseline info I'm going to give you that will guide you on the right track. First off, let's go ahead and get the basic stuff out of the way. In this game, four cards is the maximum amount of copies you can have in your deck. In other words, your playset. 50 cards is the minimum amount you must have in your deck, but there is no maximum. As long as you can comfortably shuffle and handle your deck unassisted, it can be as many cards as you'd really like. The benefit to a bigger deck is of course being able to include much more options across it, but at the risk of seeing specific cards much less consistently. If your deck is very reliant on drawing one powerful attack, it might not be the best idea to bump it up to 60 or 70 cards. Moreover, your character can also have a massive impact on the size of your deck. Characters in this game get either 5, 6, or 7 cards a turn cycle. The less cards you see, or the more aggressive your character is, the tighter your deck will usually be. For example, a very aggressive 5 hand sized character like Ochako 2 with one singular attack plan to win is going to want to coast a very tight 50 to 55 card deck. Meanwhile, Eraser Head, a much more defensive, seven hand sized character who wants access to tons of options to just handle any situation, might dwell much more in like the 65 to 70 range. And then your more run of the mill six hand sized characters who don't hyper specialize in anything and have a little more leeway, such as All Might 3, are usually going to pack the average deck size somewhere around the 60 card range. Of course though, specific characters can and will always be exceptions to these guidelines, so while they can be helpful, never treat them as absolute rules. Next, we're going to talk about ratios. Typically, you'll want about one third of your deck to be attacks, and the other two thirds to be foundations, with a few actions and assets sprinkled in. Once again though, much more aggressive characters are going to want to play more attacks than that, especially if they see fewer cards a turn. Meanwhile, characters that are forced to play more actions and assets to function might have to find some unique ways to make sure their ratios stay intact while still adhering to their playstyles. The end goal is to make sure you're seeing enough foundations to both establish and maintain a very healthy stage while also seeing enough attacks to poke your rival and go for the finish when the time is right. That can be pretty tough, especially when taking everything into account. The next thing you should be thinking about is your attack and block zones. A deck that has next to no high blocks in it is going to crumble to decks that utilize massive damage high attacks as their finishers. And if nearly every block modifier in your deck is a plus two or a plus three, you're just going to have so much trouble stopping your rival's moves. Meanwhile, if your deck is all mid attacks, then you're going to be very predictable and it's going to be incredibly easy for your rivals to plan for your attack strings. These are two very very big things to think about, but also are not rules set in stone. Massive health characters with a lot of life to lose can afford to pay a lot less attention to their block zones and modifiers. Meanwhile, some decks choose to try and go for an all low attack lineup to catch their rivals off guard. Next, you should take a look at your difficulty curve. If your attack lineup is all these awesome, massive, five difficulty attacks, 
in reality, it's going to be really hard to play lots of them successively. An ideal attack lineup is going to have a nice mix of expensive, high impact moves, and then also cheaper, low difficulty setup and poke moves. It doesn't stop there though. You should also think about difficulty when it comes to your foundations. Though they're much cheaper, you're still going to have a tough time building if your deck is nothing but two difficulty foundations, and you certainly do not want to overload yourself with three difficulty ones. Ideally, you want your deck to have at least a 50-50 split between your expensive 2 and 3 difficulty foundations and also the cheaper spam foundations that cost 1 or 0. Building and attacking in the early game are both very, very critical, and you never want your hand clogged up with so many awesome cards that you can't yet pay for. One of the most complex things about deck building in this game is that every card is so much more than meets the eye. The fact that you should consider the difficulty, the check number, the block zone, and the block modifier number of a card all before you even look at the words on the card itself is what really sets the learning curve of deck building apart in this game. But once you start to master all of those aspects, it is one of the most rewarding experiences you can find in any TCG. Now that was an even bigger lot of information, but you probably learned a lot, although it may feel a tad bit overwhelming for now. For my visual learners out there, this next part is for you. Let's go and take a look at one of the starter decks sold by Jasco Games for new players to get into the game. These decks are playable right out of the box and considered very good jumping on points. But how much do they actually adhere to both our spirit and our science? Let's find out. So I've got the deck recreated here on UVS Ultra, which, by the way, if you want to get into deck building, this is an absolutely amazing community-run deck building website for this game that you should definitely utilize. It's got everything to track card counts, types, block zones, you can sort by difficulty or quantity. It's got everything, and I'm going to have the site linked in the description below. So right off the bat, this is a very clean-cut deck. This version of Eraserhead is a six hand size character with both an aggressive and a defensive ability, so he falls right in the middle of pretty much all the guidelines we've talked about. Checking out the ratios, it is a tight 50 card deck and the block zone distribution is very decent. Normally, you're going to have more mid blocks in your deck than highs and lows, but I wouldn't mind if these numbers were a little higher. We've got 17 attacks, which in 50 cards is as close to one third as we can possibly get. Now let's take a look at our attacks. We've got a nice distribution of difficulties here, and we've also got every block zone featured on at least one attack, which is very nice. We've got setup attacks like Erasure Grasp, we have extender attacks like Shoulder Rush, and we've got big damage moves like Drop Kick. All in all, not a bad attack lineup. It's a little all over the place with all the different two ofs, but that's because as a starter deck, it's supposed to introduce you to many different styles so that you can tighten it up from there after you find out what you really like. Now, let's check out the foundation. Foundations. First off, our split is very nice. We have 33 foundations, 16 of which are spams, and 17 of which are non-spams. We have a lot of nice plus one and plus two block mods across them, and they cover our zones very well. Everything is maxed out in play sets because, again, it's a jumping on point, and they want you to not worry too much about all kinds of different cards in your stage overwhelming you. Analysis paralysis is absolutely a thing, especially when you're really new to this game. Overall, this is quite nice, and it definitely puts into practice a lot of the the things we talked about, but we can certainly improve. Let's jump over and take a peek at a modified version of this list that I put together in a few minutes to specifically follow a lot of the guidelines from before. So here is our modified list, and the first thing you're going to notice is I've bumped the deck up from 50 cards to 60. I've done this in order to include other card types as well as smooth out the block zones a little bit. And since Eraserhead here is a 6 hand size character that also draws cards and isn't reliant on specific pieces, I'm not afraid at all to bump up that count. Looking at the attacks, I've now brought in Capture Net as another setup move. This taking away my rival's resources makes it great as an opener. And then Cloth Assault that draws cards that have another really, really good extender. Erasure Grasp is still a great opening attack. Whiplash is still a fantastic extender. And Total Erasure Binding and Cloth Precision are still some great big damage moves moves that I can rely on to finish the game. The attack lineup before wasn't bad, but now every attack serves a purpose. I can easily visualize the chains in my head that I want to take to win the game. Peeking over at the foundations, I brought in Late Riser to pump my damage since my character already pumps speed, and then I've now got 
got snack time to help commit down my rival's board for my new damage to get through. I've also brought in a couple more zeros to make building easier, as well as some powerful tech pieces like Zoom and Spooky. Albeit at fairly low quantities since I only want to see one of each of them due to how they function. This starter deck already had a solid foundation base, I've just trimmed a lot of the fat and brought in some really helpful niche cards. Going over to the actions and the assets, I've actually brought in a couple USJs in here as well as a couple Nullify. These cards have some powerful properties, but they are not crucial to my game plan and I also don't want to see them too much, so again, they're here in small quantities. Lastly, I prepared a sideboard for this deck. If you don't know, a sideboard is a pile of 10 cards that you can swap in and out of your deck once you go past the first game in a best of three set. It's meant to include cards that are really powerful against very specific strategies. They're hate cards of sorts. Generally, they're meant to be there to help against those decks that you really struggle against and can provide an edge to turn the tables. Siding is a pretty advanced tactic, so I'm not going to get too much more into it, but as you can see, I've included cards that are nice silver bullets to certain playstyles just to give you a bit of an idea. Class lineup is going to commit cards of specific symbols, your so obvious reset stats against attacks that get very, very big, capture evildoers is going to steal away my rival's key momentum pieces, and villains defeated protects you from your cards being discarded. As you can see here, I have practiced everything I preached in this video with these little changes and hope Hopefully, you can take some of the applications witnessed here and improve your very own deck builds. And that's going to be it for this video. This was a big project of a video that I've wanted to make for a really long time. This card game, while being the best around, is very very complex and it has a really high barrier of entry so i think beginner resources like these are incredibly crucial to both the establishment and the further growth of the player base if you enjoyed the video personally and or learned anything from it please leave me some feedback via the like dislike button and if it put any of your decks on the right path i would love to hear about that in the comment section below and of course if you want more quality mha content like this the subscribe button is what you want to texas smash and if that doesn't quite do it for you you can also hit the join button to become a channel member, get to support my work even further, and of course, score you some very sweet perks like badges and emotes when I stream on YouTube. And lastly, if you want to decide what content I personally make and commission some videos from me, you can check out my Patreon as select from a few different tiers of personalized video commissions. I'm going to have the links to everything in the description and in the pinned comment below. Above all else though, thanks so much just for making it to the end of this video. That's all the time I've got for today, but I do hope I can see you in the next one.